So, John, it's, to it's Tony and Bob again in the studio here in Eastern Connecticut. Welcome back, my friend. Hi, John. Hi, how you doing? Nice well, to be back, guys. Hey, it's, it's always great to have you. We're uh, always a pleasure. I just told our audience you're one of our favorite guests, one of our favorite friends of the show. And we just hope everything's uh, been well with you and your family since the last time we spoke, John. Doing very well. Thank you. Good to hear a, a little more background. I should have kept the old notes from the other two shows, <laughs> but I had to write up a new set. John uh, played for six teams between 1973 and 82. Tony, the Giants, Cardinals, Padres, Expos, Angels, and A's. He appeared in 266 Major League games, 92 as a starting pitcher. Seven complete games over that span and even 600 strikeouts in his career. Uh, born in San Diego, drafted by San Francisco in the first round of the 1970 draft. And uh, at last count, he had played for 13 managers and with 11 Hall of Famers. I might be off a little bit there. but uh, You're about right. At about right, John, and now 13 managers in 10, in 10 years, is, if my math is correct, that's 1.3 per, <laughs> per year. It uh, shows you the permanence of baseball. Does that, tell you, does that tell you the kind of teams I played on at the time? <laughs> my God. Oh, that was great. You know, they were changing managers more than I changed my uniform. You know? I mean, my goodness. Uh, it was funny, but, uh, you know, uh, a lot of these questions, John, will probably be repeat. We're going to do some basic things that we always do. But remind our audience, here you are growing up in California. Uh, baseball, was it your first love? And tell us some of your sport heroes uh, as a youngster. Sure. Uh, I, I grew up in San Diego, California. And uh, I, I grew, grew up on a transistor radio and an earbud out of my ear uh, listening to Vin Scully and the Dodgers uh, broadcast. Uh, I was able to get uh, Vin's games down in San Diego, uh, you know, on the night games because uh, the interference wasn't as bad. And so uh, a lot of my boyhood idols at the time were guys like Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Pee Wee Reese. Uh, you know, let's go right down. Maury Wills, uh, you know, guys like that. And uh, then uh, on TV, we were only able to get either the Yankee games or the Giant games. Hmm. So it was one or the other or Dodger games. And then we had to, uh, so when I grew up, I, I, I really got started falling in love with the uh, San Francisco Giant franchise uh, because of Willie Mays. And, uh, you know, getting, getting to see that, that group and then uh, Juan Marichal winning 27 games uh, one year, uh, I, I, I donned his number in high school, number 27, because mm -hmm. I, I liked the way he pitched. He had that high leg kick and he had, uh, you know, great, great stamina and a lot of complete games and he was a great pitcher. So I had a really uh, plethora of players that I – idolized and and also Mickey Mantle you know every every kid liked Mickey Mantle back back in the 50s you know and, you know and so I was very fortunate to to grow up in an era with some great great Hall of Fame stars and uh we should remind our audience Tony we just found out that Vince Scully one of uh, my favorite guys being a Fordham a grad yeah. 66 years he will come back for one more John is that amazing or is he just and he sounds exactly I, he like he I did 40 years ago wonderful <laughs> yeah it, it, it's amazing because I just saw Vin last time they were here in Arizona and uh, you know he looks great and you know he saw my face and he goes Johnny Biaquisto my god it's great to see you the man's 86 years old. <laughs> I'm blessed. You know, and he's sharp as a tack. He's a great guy. We laughed about stories about, you know, when, when my brother ran into him at the airport and told him that he wasn't pronouncing my name properly. And, and, and Vin sat down when I got to Dodger Stadium. He sat down with me in our dugout, and, and he goes, uh, so tell me, how do I pronounce your name? And I said, well, it's. Two ways. You got a, the, the way that it's Italian 
said in Italian, and then you got the way my dad says it. So I'm going to give you Italian, and that's di acquisto. And then I'm going to give you the way my dad says it, which is di acquisto. And so I said, you take your pick. Either one's fine. He goes, I like it the way your dad says it. I said, then we'll go with that. And And we were laughing about that when that happened. And, you know, Vin, Vin is just a consummate class act all the way around. A legend yeah, and a, a, a one of a kind. And uh, we, uh, Tony and I, usually ask John, uh, John about uh, people's debuts. And I just have to find, you know, you, you come up to the bigs in 1973. Uh, the feelings of walking into a major league clubhouse for the first time, was the, was it nervousness? Was it relief that you made it? Were you anxious? Were you confident? Uh, tell us about when you first walked into a major league clubhouse. Well, the first time I walked into a major league clubhouse, I was 19 years old, and that was in spring training in in Casa Grande, Arizona. And I walked in through the training room door, and the first person I met was Leo Hughes, who was our trainer, and Al Wilder, and then Harry Jordan was there, who was the AAA trainer. And so... I walk in, and as I'm walking in, I've, I've got my suitcases and, you know, everything else with me that I'm supposed to have, my, my so-called bag that, you know, my giant bag that <laughs> looked like it was from 1920. But uh, I, I walk into the clubhouse, and, and I meet Mike Murphy. And Mike Murphy, who is the, uh, the managing clubhouse man, at, uh, uh, assistant at the time, to Eddie Logan. And uh, Eddie was with the New York Giants. He came out with the New York Giants. And so Mike took me over to my locker, and they put me in the corner. Uh, I had one locker, and then there were eight other lockers adjacent that were filled with stuff. And he goes, that's Mr. Mays, his locker, and all seven other lockers. And my knees started shaking. Oh. Because Willie Mays was sitting right there. Wow. And I'm looking at him. I'm 19. I was just collecting bubblegum cards from him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Willie Mays, the great Willie Mays. He's got his shirt off and his, you know, his pants on, you know, his game pants on. And and I walked up to him that extended in my hand. He goes, oh, you're the new kid. You're the guy that throws the ball like faster than anything we've ever seen before. And I go, yes, sir, Mr. Mays. And he goes, don't call me Mr. Mays. Call me Willie. We were the same. We were the same uh, team. We're on the same team. Yes, Mr. Mays. He goes, don't call me Mr. Mays. I said, yes, Mr. Mays. He says, all right, enough of that. I said, yes, Willie. Wow. It's making me nervous just listening to that story. story. Yeah, it's something. Yeah. And then he gave me a box of golf balls that I still have to this day that say Willie Mays on them, 24. And, and you know what? He, he says, no, oh, go ahead and use them. I said, are you crazy? I'm going to save these. These are keepsakes. He goes, you should keepsake them on the course. They work well. And, and oh. he goes, if you need more, I'll give them to you. And I went, oh, my goodness. I How mean, cool is that? I'm, I'm finally here. You know, I'm finally here. I finally made it. That yeah. had to be the greatest feeling. I, I just can't imagine. Again, uh, for our fans, we're on the phone with former Major League pitcher John DiAquisto. We have Dylan Randazzo and Andrew Flynn running the board in the back. Tony, question for John. John, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for being here with us. You know, Bob and I were talking last week about... Uh, I, I grew up in Stanford, Connecticut, and a neighbor for a time, not in my neighborhood... But, uh, okay, five, you're five. breaking up. I can't hear you. Please oh, get I'm, to the microphone. I'm sorry, John. Um, when I was, uh, I grew up in Stanford, Connecticut, and uh, the uh, a neighbor for a time, even though he wasn't uh, ex- exactly a neighbor, was Dave Kingman, one of your teammates. And uh, I was thinking about the fact of, you know, he would have been great if, uh, somebody would have DH'd him and then he pitched once in a while. And I guess that's my question. How come baseball, at least at the major league level, has this great area of specialization where it seems like when we play baseball as kids, you know, we're playing all kinds of positions. I mean, is there a reason for it? Is it, you know, is it difficult? I, I didn't hear the last part. Your mic is breaking up. 
Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, Bob, maybe you want to answer. Yeah, basically, John, uh, the difference in, in the way kids are playing different positions. Uh, Kingman, as Tony said, was a, a pitcher and an outfielder, yes. right? Uh, yes. But, um, yes. The way the people specialize in things now, uh, it seemed like there was a lot more uh, versatility uh, back in the day. Uh, do you get that feeling? Yes, yes. Uh, there, there was a lot more uh, versatility. You know, Dave Kingman could have been a pitcher in the big leagues. He threw over 95 miles an hour in college, mm -hmm. and, and, and he won a lot of games. He had pretty good control, and, you know, but they wanted to see those those home runs. Uh, in fact, if I recall, I think and you guys you guys can look it up that Kingman did pitch in a game. I think so. He might have pitched once. Yeah, I think he pitched one game, and and and, and he did pretty good too. I, you know, so it there there was a lot of versatility. I I myself even played outfield. Uh, I was an outfielder, right fielder, center fielder, left fielder, wherever you wanted to put me, uh, and, and I could hit a little bit. I hit 269 one year, you know, which was uh, I was doing better as a hitter than I was as a pitcher. It was right after I got hurt. But, you know, these things are uh, the versatility of the athlete that was playing back in the 70s and early 80s was extremely high. Everybody knew how to do different things and, and could play different positions. Uh, nowadays, everyone is so specialized as a go all the way down as far as a relief pitcher, uh, specialist uh, left-handers, uh, short short inning, short inning, uh, one inning, uh, right-handed pitchers, uh, right. uh, fastball pitchers. Uh, we've got we've got uh, guys that throw junk, side armors. Uh, you see them all over the place, and and yet. You know, we, we look at that the that, that versatility is, is diminishing and it's becoming a specialized sport now. Yeah, it it really is and uh great athletes out there but uh it seemed um back in the day uh there was always a backup plan. And of course we've had stories about former giants on the show, John. Everyone has their own playing in the wicked cold winds and place called Candlestick Park or whatever you want to call it. But, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, what was it like playing and pitching in there just on a, say, a cold 40-degree April evening with the wind just whipping off the water? Just try to describe that. Well, uh, you know, when I first got there in 1973, I looked in my locker and I saw this big football park up. That went from from uh, the top of your it had a big hood on it, and it went from the top of your head all the way down to the floor. And I'm going, are you you got to be kidding me? And then I saw the the warm up jacket, which was uh, you know double line, uh, kind of like uh, down, you know, inside and you know thick and puffy. And I'm going, okay. Then I saw a light jacket, and I'm going, are you got to be kidding me? And so I asked Mike Murphy, I said, Mike, what's all this get up? He says, oh, you'll find out tonight. Oh, boy. You're going to find out tonight because it was 36-degree wind chill factor at the park. Oh, holy crow. And so when you go out, you know, you bust out of the uh, at candlestick. You come out of the back. Uh, both clubhouses were on the same side, one across from the other. And, and you walk out the same tunnel together. And I felt... Yeah, I didn't feel that bad for the visiting team because they had to walk across, you know, to get into their clubhouse. But they were on the clear on the other side and had no way to get to the clubhouse. And once they were out on the field, they were out on the field pretty much. Wow. You know, and they had bathroom facilities, but that was it. And, you know, we're sitting here on the other side. We got a long hallway. We got a sauna. You know, we got all, this, all, all the amenities you could think of. And the visitors... We're sitting there with nothing. And, and so Charlie Fox, who was my manager, told me to throw one up, up into the middle of the, of, of the screen. He goes, we want you to come across as being wild. <laughs> so Charlie was the one that gave me that label a long time ago, and it followed me my whole career. <laughs> you know, so I threw one up into the, uh, up into the backstop, and, and you can hear the guys in the dugout across the way going, oh, my God, you've got to be kidding me. we got to face this. 
in this weather? And, and he's just uh, crying and complaining. And, uh, you know, my first game of, uh, that I went to a complete game, uh, I struck out 11 mm. and uh, happened to be against my old hometown and my best buddy, Randy Jones. Wow. Yeah, former guest on the show. That that that's something. He uh, was a great pitcher himself. And uh, you know, you mentioned San Diego, John. You know, after the short stay in St. Louis, you end up in San Diego. You know, weather wise, you're like night and day compared to Frisco, oh, yeah. and, and you're in the same exactly. state. It must have been like you were let out of jail. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. It was very much so. It was like it, going back to Candlestick. You know, it was like. Coming to San Diego was like a breath of fresh air. Mm. You know, playing in 76 degree weather, you know, it's nice and cool. You know, you're playing at night in the summertime, you know, you could wear a short sleeve shirt and go out and pitch. And, you know, it, it, it was nice. It was nice. And being able to be home in front of your, your hometown and plus having four good years there, yeah. you know, it, it really, really worked out well for me. And, and, uh, I, I really wanted to stay there, but you know, I had to, I, I had to be like everybody else and test that free agent market, which was a big mistake in my opinion. So, you know, I just should have stayed at home and taken my extension. They wanted to extend me another three years, and you know, I thought that was pretty decent, but my agent didn't at the time, ah, so mm -hmm. I had to move on. Sometimes the grass is not greener, right? <laughs> oh, well. I know. Sometimes we look back and we go, I sight 2020. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all yep. have done it, John. And again, on the phone with former pitcher John D'Aquisto, his good friends call him Johnny D. Tony, question? I hope we're better now, John. <laughs> yeah, you are. You're Thank, really you. Clear. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. You know, I'm curious. Uh, you know, you, you've been in baseball. You've been a dad. How do you feel about this Little League World Series stuff? We used to look forward to it, and I read things about it's too much pressure on the kids. The parents are overly involved. It's now, a, you know, it's bigger than life itself. I mean, uh, what are we doing with kids and baseball? Bob and I just drive by ballparks on Saturdays. We don't see anybody playing, you know, and we used to fight to get yeah, on I ball know. fields. I, uh, I, I know. Like your impressions of that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of with you guys on that. You know, I, I grew up, I grew up in the Sandlot League in San Diego, and you know, I played little league ball, but my dad took me out because uh, he had heard the coach was going to use me every game, huh. so he could win win the trophy. Hmm. And my dad says, "You're not going to play little league this year. I'm going to put you in the parochial school league, Sandlot League, uh, at school." And I said, why? He says, because it, it, it's just better for you. It's going to be better for you. He never told me, and then he told me later on what, what this coach wanted to, do, wanted to do, and it could potentially have hurt me. So I ended up playing in the parochial school league, the Sandlot League, and, and, but I played only for one team, one team. Nowadays, you've got kids playing Little League baseball. They're playing on travel league teams, not one, not two, but three in some instances. And and some and more more rapidly, you're looking at you're looking at they're playing on at least two travel teams because they're talented and they're and they're sought after, and so you got a lot of overuse going on. You don't have kids going out on the, onto the sandlots and playing pickup games like they used to, riding their bikes to the park and getting there and and having games and pickup games and enjoying themselves and having fun. Mm -hmm. You know, playing workups or playing a game together with with a bunch of kids. You know, you, you don't see it anymore, and 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 the pressures from the parents because of these big contracts. You got all this pressure of, of of mom and dad wanting little Johnny to go out and get a big contract, and they don't understand and realize that the percentages are so low to get a chance to even be a big league ball player because of the worldwide uh, injection of talent, you know, from, from, the, from the Caribbean, you know, into Mexico, you know, all the way down into Far Venezuela, yeah. and Colombia, and Japan, and Korea, all these other teams. And now you've got Europe coming in, and, and you've got the, the Goombatis in Italy are now sending guys in that are playing big league ball. Yeah. What are you going to do? 
you know, all this pressure comes on these kids, and 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 then the the parents got the guts enough to sit there and yell at the kid and make the kid feel like he's a nothing. Mm. You know, these kids need to be patted on the back. They need to be educated, and they need to be put in the right direction and how and and taught how to play fundamental baseball and go level to level to level. Each level, you increase the fundamentals, and you show them how to play, and their talents will seek their own level. Boy, we talk about it all the time. All the time. It's, it's almost like you could join us every day, John. We talk about how uh, everyone's looking for shortcuts, and it usually is never a good thing. Uh, shortcuts right. to the big leagues these days, and I, you're, you're the man to ask, John, as far as uh, these guys, I think they look at it as my quickest ticket to the major leagues is throwing the ball 95 miles per hour uh, through a brick wall. And uh, is that what you see, John, as far as contributing to a lot of these guys? It's almost like the Tommy John surgery is becoming, as Tony says, cosmetic. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is because of the fact these kids are getting hurt early. Dr. Andrews sees more kids now than he has ever seen before. Ever. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to tell you a story. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a father contact me on Facebook. And he asked me, he, he, actually he told me, he says, my son is throwing 55 to 60 miles an hour right now, which is equivalent almost to 90, 80, 85 to 90 miles an hour in, uh, on a big league mound. And I'm going to try to get him up to 95. How do I do it? I said, you don't. Mm. You don't do it. Don't force your kid to throw harder than what he's thrown. Let him mature. Let him mature into it himself. If, if if he has that potential, if he has the makeup to be a 95 mile an hour pitcher, let him develop on his own. Wow. I said, but you know, you got to you got to do all the physical training that goes with it. It just doesn't happen. There's no special technique or mechanics that goes with this. You have to build your body up. To, to be able to do this. And, and he goes, well, will you tell me how to do it? Once again, not listening to what I'm saying. Sure, yeah. That's, uh... Uh, he wanted to know. And so I told him what I did as a kid and worked my way up, and it was primarily a lot of leg work and ab work, and then I played football, so I lifted weights, but uh, just for football, but then... For baseball, I did a lot of lightweight with, with a lot of repetition. Mm -hmm. But I did more more so a lot of leg work. I had very strong legs. And I ran a lot. And that's why I paid the price and got two new hips now. But, mm -hmm. you know, because of that, you have to go out and do the specific training and balance your body for that specific sport. And nowadays, parents aren't interested in, 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 in the physical training part of it, they're more so interested on the mechanics and the techniques that can increase my son's fastball. Right, and which goes back to... And that's the mistake they make, yeah. guys. The that's the mistake yeah. they make. They, uh, it's a fast-forward thing to get my kid where he wants to go. Uh, how does it do? I don't care about anything else. I don't yeah. care about the maturation process. Tell me uh, the secret recipe, and, and John is supposed to give him, okay, do this, do this, do this, and you'll see him in the majors in three years. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, it's only... somebody else's no, son got there. No, it doesn't work that way. And that's the misconception that a lot of parents have today, that they want their son, <clears throat> and now we see their daughter, uh, bless her heart, she's out there striking out six and taking her team to the World Series this year, and I think she's, she's quite a talented young lady. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, more power to her. Go for it. But here's, here's the problem. You have a lot of kids. Now, we've proven, we've proven two things wrong in the studies that you can. If you physically train yourself early enough to sustain the rigors of pitching off a mound in an unnatural motion, you should be able to sustain good health without risk of injury in a time period of longevity. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? 
Yeah. <laughs> the answer is yes. Right. You can do it. Do they do it now? The answer is no. no. And here's the reason why. They train all the pitchers and all the players one way and one way only. Everybody's different. We're all different. We all have different fingerprints. We all have all different body makeups. Our, our arm lengths are longer and shorter. Our torsos are short and long, and our legs are long and short. Everything's different. The levers are different. The sequences are different in the kinetic chain sequence of the body when used in a pitching motion. So what does that mean? you got to train differently. There's different stresses on different right. parts of the body, and you have to train them accordingly to your specific body strengths and weaknesses. And you have to balance your body to fit and ascertain a pitching motion. Mm. Kind of, It sounds common sense to me. What do you see wrong uh, as far as what are they doing collectively wrong to uh, everyone now, John? Well, collectively wrong, the coaches that are coaching at the high school level are not into the specific training factors of weight training. They're just specific coaches that give specific drills and workouts to their kids. Mm -hmm. None of them are exercise scientists and physiologists. Uh, they're straight baseball coaches. If that, they're probably a teacher that's teaching English one or, or English two, okay, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. and comes out uh, out of the goodness of his heart and teaches the team how to play baseball mm -hmm. because of budget. Yeah, and you don't have enough fine-tuned teaching in the high at the at the high school level, and even prior to that. How many of these kids are seeking advice from, say, an ex-major league player? But what worked for that player might not work for that kid. Correct. Right. It's, uh, that's a great So, point. you know, all this information that this player had is going to this kid, and you've got to stand tall and fall versus a drop and drive, and you've got three, four different theories of pitching, coming out of, you know, different areas. There's no consistency at that point on body mechanics. Yeah. But everyone is different. Everyone is different. If you see a kid at first and you look at a kid and I say, okay, he's throwing three quarters, he uses his legs, let's work with what he's got. He's got pretty good stuff. There's a couple of things I might change, but I'm going to keep everything else intact. Or... Do I have a kid that's all over the place? His windup is everywhere, and I got to bring him inside. I got to bring everything towards the center of gravity in his body because his arm's failing here. He's opening up too quick, and he's got very, very poor control. Well, you can spot these things if you're a good pitching coach, and you can correct those things very, very easily and very fast. Mm -hmm. But you have to be trained to see it, and most of the coaches today aren't trained to see it. Even the coach, when I coached at East Lake High School in Chula Vista, Dave Gonzalez, who's a great Hall of Fame coach in San Diego, hired me to come on as his pitching coach because he didn't know how to teach the kids. Well, you, you got to go to people who know. And, and you're right, John. I mean, a, 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 a co I can only imagine a high school coach just looking at kids and says, I, I think you're doing this right. Why don't we change this? And then and you wonder why kids get screwed up. John's had an excellent point. How do you really know? Well, and well it, that's the thing. I would know. Yeah, I would, would know, but a parent wouldn't know. No, no. And that's what I'm saying. That's the misconception that the parents have. They, they put their trust into the coach because they want their kid to play for this school. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, parents and they're really kind of stuck. They're really stuck. They're very limited. Yeah. They, you know, they bought a new house. They're living. Dad works in the area. He puts his kids, got some talent. He puts them on the team. The kid gets overlooked. He don't even play. Mm. Now, think about that side. Yeah. How many times have we seen kids that are really, really talented not get the shot that they deserve? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's a lot, of, a lot of extenuating factors that come into play, especially at the high school level. 
I know I coached, I coached for three years. We were fortunate enough to have a great coaching staff that uh, we had a selection process that worked, mm. but we also won. We won 90 games in three years. Yeah. We topped out at 30 and five, 30 and four, 31 and two. Wow. I mean, we went to the playoffs every year. Yeah, that, that's impressive. And uh, again, um, there's a lesson to be learned there, Tony. You know, stick with expertise. And but parents, I know what's best for my kid. No, you don't. You know, go the other way. And you know, I was going to ask you, John, keeping on that kind of saying, you yourself, sure. having played for 13 different managers, now that's a lot of different <laughs> pitching coaches, too. I, I was going to ask the same question. <laughs> right? So yeah. pitching you coaches. You me? I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, John, is Every the... time I looked up, I had a new manager. I'm going, okay, I just got to know this one. He was the one that brought me up. Now I got Wes Westrom. Okay, <laughs> Wes is a nice guy. Okay, Wes is gone. Now I got Bill Rigney. Oh, well, okay, fine. <laughs> I had three managers in a matter of three years. But it must have made no, your, man. your head must have spun, John, with the the pitching coaches yeah. is, getting used to pitching coaches and, and Tony. Is the pitching coach the manager's drinking buddy often? <laughs> uh, and more times than not, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, look at Billy Martin and Art Feller. Yes. You know? That's classic. That's and the, most of the time, it's somebody that they know really close, unless it's, unless it's an organizational man, you know, like 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 Dave Rogetti's an organizational man. He's he's yeah. been there for what fourteen years, mm -hmm. and Rags is a great pitching coach. Yes, he is. I mean, you you could ask for a better pitching coach. You know, he's smart. He knows he knows the motion. He knows he knows biomechanics. Uh, you know, but I, I'll tell you one one guy who's really got my eye. That's a very good friend of mine, and we worked together uh, off off the field in uh, biomechanical analysis, and that's Brent Strong over at Houston. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Brent Brent is a San Diego boy, and Brent's doing a fine job over there with those Astros pitchers. And uh, you know, uh, he is a very astute and very intelligent pitching coach. And those biomechanics inside and out. Uh, you know, I, I just, I, I talked to Brent for a half hour when they were here in Arizona about about pitching technique, and uh, he really, uh, he really misses working with me, and I really miss working with him. But you know, it's just an email and a phone call away. We talk about stuff all the time, but uh, Brent's, Brent's, uh, Brent's got it going on. He knows what's going on. Yeah, you remember him well, Tony. Pitching uh, for the Mets. The Mets yep. way back in the yep. day. We we saw him come up. Wow, that's that's a name from the past. But I'm glad to hear. Yep, he's and he played there. with me in San Diego too. Yes, yeah, that was yep. uh, wow, Prince. So you know, there's a guy that knows a lot. And then Eric Rasmussen, you know, who's a very good friend of mine. He's a pitching coach coordinator at uh, Minnesota. He he knows this stuff too because we talk all the time about it. Eric Rasmus. Yeah, he, and, yeah. he is very astute. He, uh, Not too much into the biomechanics, but more to the old school training methodologies, which are really good. We have a few more minutes with you, John, and our. Well, then we're going to talk about our featured team of the week is going to be the 79 Padres, and Eric uh, Rasmussen was on that team along with uh, yourself. So this, this is going to be a lot of fun. So, um, oh, yeah. A couple questions. Yeah, and as far as um, John with all your experience in baseball, following pitching, you know, the passionate guy that you are about baseball, ever think about getting back in, working in the front office or managing or coaching? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, uh, a couple of offers have come my way, and I cannot say who they are. Of course not. But yeah. they have come my way recently at the major league level. Uh, I was told to wait till next year, and... Uh, one is, uh, you know, very promising. Uh, I, I just look at things as if it happens, it happens. Understand. All right, because there's a lot of extenuating circumstances that come into play. And it, everything, the timing has to be right, and it has to be totally acceptable with the front office. But, yes, I would love to get back as a coach, especially a pitching coach. Mm -hmm. With the amount of knowledge that I have in the biomechanical analysis side of it, uh, and having my degree in it, uh, it, you know, it would be an absolute sin not to be back in, in, in ball. And I'm not getting any freaking younger either. <laughs> 
No, but you, you get... We the, can share that. Yeah, the, per, the perfect... <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> the perfect resume, John, though. I mean, a former pitcher, degreed individual, having done it and watched it. You ha and, you know, a pitching coach is a tweaking job. You watch video and you could see a lot. And uh, what can we do? We, we could only wish you the best of luck. Um, we got a couple... Yeah. We got a couple, just a few seconds left. Um, you know, okay. just tell us what else you've been up to uh, lately, John. Uh, we uh, well, I'm back been... in baseball. Yep. I'm working for MLB okay. uh, on the network side, uh, doing the field timing coordinator and uh, partially uh, the uh, relaying the uh, uh, potential replays that are coming to mm -hmm. New York. And so I've been doing that for for the for this season. And it has been very rewarding, and, and that's why those two offers came my way, because guys saw me and asked me if I liked what I was doing and wanted to do something else. Isn't that correct? And so, so, but yeah, I'm, I'm back working at uh, MLB right now. Well, that's terrific, and uh, you keep us abreast of what's going on. You know how to contact me. Uh, the time flies by when we speak with you, and those are the best guests we have. Uh, we uh, Maybe we can get you on uh, toward the end of the year to discuss the actual baseball on the field. We usually get into some old stuff, some Kinda mechanical racist, stuff, yeah. and it's, it's just terrific, and we try to uh, hit different places uh different uh subjects when we talk to you but we can never get to them all but uh john you keep in touch and um we'll uh we'll definitely uh speak to you very soon my friend take care john that was good Bobby. thanks tony you take thanks, care guys. Good, good night, night.